Well, this is really it. Hey guys, I'm Sir Alam One. You already know by now. Dean, whatever you want to call me. And welcome to my final Kingdom Hearts 3 trailer analysis. And don't even comment to me saying this isn't the final trailer, but instead the final battle trailer. Square Enix Japan has marketed this trailer as the final trailer all along during the schedule, and it is even named the final trailer on their channel. Of course, like I said in my last video, I fully expect Square to keep uploading Kingdom Hearts videos and advertisements, but since this is what looks like it's supposed to be a final trailer, a means to an end, this will be my final analysis. There was a vague translation of a tweet before where Nomura said suddenly something new has come up and it's being edited right now. I have no idea what that is because the context is very strange here with him talking about 15 second commercials, but no matter what that sudden video is, I'm considering this the final, real, full length trailer. That makes this my final Kingdom Hearts 3 trailer analysis. It's been a lot of fun over the years, but this is where our road ends, so let's make it a good one. I've been having these weird thoughts lately. Like, is any of this for real? Or not? A scattered dream that's like a far-off memory. A far-off memory that's like a scattered dream. I want to line the pieces up. Yours and mine. They can take your world. They can take your heart. Cut you loose from all you know. But if it's your fate, then every step forward will always be a step closer to home. Man, Sora's quotes keep getting longer and longer. This quote at the beginning of the trailer sounds like the new opening quote for the game that would play right before the intro begins. The meaning of the quote of course is ambiguous, but you can relate it a little to several elements of the trailer where Sora seems to lose everything, all his friends are gone and he feels alone in this battle. If we look at the scenery going on during this quote, at first we see Xehanort standing on a Keyblade graveyard platform, sending a purple beam into the sky probably to summon forth Kingdom Hearts. This is the same purple beam he used in the past in Birth by Sleep, except this time he's using his Keyblade instead of it coming out of his hand. Right next to him, there are six copies of his Keyblade, which is very interesting. I was wondering how certain things would work, like Terra Xehanort and Old Xehanort wielding the same Keyblade, but if it's able to be copied or summoned in multiple places at once, by the people who have a piece of his heart or whatever else, that answers that question. In the frame, there are six Keyblades, with the one he's holding being the seventh, but there are definitely more, since in the 15 second commercial that was released, he is surrounded by Keyblades. So I assume that there are like 13 of these, and each of the Xehanort vessels are probably able to or are going to be granted the ability to wield one. Ooh, that commercial made my job a little easier. In the next scene, we see Xehanort floating in front of Kingdom Hearts, but this time he seems to be pointing his Keyblade at it to draw darkness out of it or corrupt it in some way. Very scary sight. Sora in the next shot is on his knees, as you can tell by seeing what looks like his leg and shoe on the ground in the back here. He also has the Big Hero 6 Keyblade equipped here, could be another hint that Big Hero 6 is the last Disney world we visit chronologically in the story, since he's standing on what looks to be a platform of ruins in the Keyblade graveyard. We've seen Xehanort bring this up in the Winnie the Pooh trailer from underground in this world, but I'm gonna try and save the rest of the ruins talk for the end of the video. After that, we got Aqua fading into darkness. When I first watched this, I thought this was a glimpse of what looks like maybe after you defeat the Dark Aqua and save her, but looking closely, the darkness isn't going away, it's beginning to engulf her. So I would say this scene is probably happening after Ansem visits her in the Realm of Darkness, which I think is the reason for her falling to darkness at all. So this could be right after that encounter. Looking at the Keyblade Graveyard again, we see a far shot of these pillars. There are two coded figures standing on the left, and the rest of the pillars don't seem to have anyone here at the moment. There are 13 pillars in total here, so most likely one for each darkness to stand on. The layout of these pillars has a striking similarity to the organization's old meeting place where nothing gathers. 
I think that this will be a recurring place that we see over the course of the game, like in Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix, we would periodically see the organization talk to each other with what's going on behind the scenes in between worlds. I think this is happening again in Kingdom Hearts 3 with this area. When we get a closer look at the pillars, it seems like a different scene where more of the organization members are present. To me, this looks like Luxord, Demix because of the sitar, maybe Larxene because this figure looks slimmer than the rest and in a couple of frames there's this weird thing sticking out behind their head that kind of reminds me of Larxene's hair. If not her then my next best bet is like Vanitas or something. Next is a gigantic Disney low Marluxia with the long hair, an empty seat, and someone else who looks like they might have long hair. I think it's Vexen. Whenever we see this area, there's sometimes these extra thin pillars that nobody ever stands on. Maybe it means it's a member that Sora took out over some time over the course of the game, or it's just someone who's not here right now and who Xehanort hates enough to not give a proper standing space. Moving on, we're gonna see a lot of Disney stuff. Sora in his Kingdom Hearts 2 outfit is in Thebes and it's getting destroyed. This must be when things are getting real, either when the Titans are released or just some Wrath of Hades. We've seen this place in shambles and on fire in the past trailers. In the Monsters Inc. world, the party is running away from an explosion. On the first frame of this, we can maybe see a purplish figure here. Could this be Randall that is in the explosion or is causing the explosion? A little later, we can see that the fire is coming from these pipes and they explode. Wow, this whole facility is just going downhill. Next, we have a toy box scene, but the environment is completely engulfed in darkness, and I'm guessing this is before or after some major boss. We see Buzz floating in darkness. Remember, it does seem like a theme in this world is toys being possessed by the Heartless, which is what seemed to happen with the Gigas and this doll boss we saw during Tokyo Game Show, so something along those lines could be happening with Buzz right now. Buzz flies upward and then we have a cut, but the darkness is all fading away and Donald is pointing at the sky. It could still be Buzz up there or this could be after the Buzz conflict because the sky seems to be clearing up from the darkness. This whole scene is very good at hiding the mystery and the context. Rapunzel pushes Mother Gothel out of the way and this is our first time seeing the mother in motion. It's a reference to the scene where Rapunzel realizes she's the lost princess in Tangled. In the next scene, we see Sora, Donald, and Goofy riding on Maximus with Flynn, likely a reference to the scene when Flynn is rushing back to the tower to save Rapunzel. Tigger sees Sora in Hundred Acre Wood and pounces on him. Sora, Donald, and Goofy and Remy talk to Scrooge in Twilight Town. Maybe he's investing into the restaurant that you cook at with Remy? And we see a cute scene of Sora and Remy doing a little high five. Could be a minigame victory animation or just what it's like when they meet. Look at all the NPCs in the background, Kingdom Hearts really has changed. We have a recreation of the sequence in Let It Go where Elsa makes the ice stairs except now we can see Sora run up behind her as she does this. It really looks like we're gonna get a cutscene of her singing Let It Go. Hmm. Kristoff is running towards Anna. This scene is just like the movie as well when Anna's heart is slowly freezing up. And we got an action scene of Jack Sparrow and Davy Jones sword fighting, likely another reference to that movie. Okay, they nailed the Disney movies, we get it. Now what? Ah, something a little different. Sora jumps off of Baymax to whack Dark Baymax, but he was able to grab Baymax's leg, and the two Baymaxes struggle on the way down while Sora wonders what he's doing with his life. The spinning Baymaxes make a great transition to the Stitch Link in the next scene. In the very first frame, we see Sora activate the finish command for Stitch, but after a cut, Sora's HP and MP are completely different from before. The Japanese trailer has a very similar cut for some reason. I still think it's showing off the finish here though. Wow, that's damage. Next we get our first big surprise, or not surprise depending on how you look at it, playable Riku. He's fighting, oh no, how many times are we gonna get a demon tower fight in this game? We already had two and a demon tide just in 0.2 and it seems like this enemy will not be taking a backseat at all in Kingdom Hearts 3. Something else you'll notice is that Riku has no focus gauge at all. This means he can't do shot locks. That also hints at this being a short playable episode for Riku instead of something super long or a separate story of course, which is how I would like them to handle other playable characters so this seems perfect. 
Nomura hinted at a second playable character back during E3, and even though he was only hinting at one, I do think Kairi will also most likely get a little playable episode somewhere in the story, like Riku seems to have here. Looking at this Riku one, it's either a playable episode somewhere mid-game, or this is a super early sequence of the game before they introduce shot locks to you at all. He also has no Mickey party member, which is very weird because he was supposed to come down here with Mickey. It could be after Mickey was restrained or sucked into whatever this thing he's in here is. The Demon Tower boss seems to function mostly the same, but we see Riku activate a brand new situation command for Dark Faraga and it's purple. The purple situation commands are usually unlocked by using magic spells on enemies. It's super cool to see Dark Faraga return, but it's been changed a bit now to be a blast that disperses into multiple shots that track the enemy for almost like a quick Ragnarok type of effect instead of just a straight shot. When Riku jumps to attack, he weirdly starts with this gigantic spinning attack which does give off the impression that his gameplay is going to seem more on the slow and floaty side instead of direct to the point attacks. Hey, maybe he'll be our replacement for the super weird Mickey combo style in Kingdom Hearts 2. In the Japanese trailer, the Riku player does something completely different. He starts off with the same spinny attack, man how is that a starter? And then he uses Dark Roll, which we've seen before in Dream Drop Distance, and it cuts to him using Thunder Spells. Because he has his shortcut menu open, we get a sneak peek into what kind of shortcuts Riku has. They translate to Thundaga, Kiraga, High Potion, and Aether. Huh, maybe Thunder and Cure really are his only spells. Also, it's just kind of weird that it doesn't say the amount of the item next to the name. In 0.2, it definitely would tell you how many of each item you have in your shortcuts. In our next scene, we get a reveal of a brand new Keyblade. This is a Ratatouille Keyblade. I guess you would unlock this by finishing all of the recipes for the cooking minigame with Remy, and I think it's really cool to see an optional looking Keyblade like this one. The transformation is called Frying Pan, which uh, sure leaves a lot to the imagination, and you can see Sora creates a mini Eiffel Tower during the transformation animation before it becomes what looks like a weapon that Sora holds like a shield. But he's not in guard form. The green form is what I think is speed form. We don't get to see any footage of Sora normally using the frying pan in combat because it cuts straight to the finish in which Sora smacks the enemy with a giant burning pan. We also see a new party member situation command for something called Donald Meteor. I guess this is supposed to be an evolution of Kingdom Hearts 2's Donald Comet, and there was some footage of it released on the Japanese Kingdom Hearts 3 website. The three boss enemies here are the same ones we saw in a TGS 2018 PlayStation Stage demo. Up next, we seem to go into a collage of minigames where Sora is using the Mad Teacups attraction flow, but his party is gone and we got a score counter. We got these little truffle-like heartless things again, and it seems the goal is to stack as many of these guys as you can without having them fall, or just to collect them all. And what's up with this one rolling on like a ball here? Would he knock your tower down if you touched it, or would you collect him? In the Japanese one, there's now multiple of these heartless on balls, or strawberries I guess to keep up the whole food theme. And we can see new ones spawn right in the middle of the minigame, so that tells us there isn't a set amount to collect, and it's probably a high score time challenge where they'll keep respawning. In the Pirates world, Sora is in an area that looks exactly like the starting area of Port Royal in Kingdom Hearts 2, which may confirm Port Royal to be a playable area in the Caribbean. This challenge looks like Sora needs to time and attack the correct cannons to fire down as many of these guys as possible. This time we can see a watermelon theme going on. In the Japanese gameplay only, the bell in the center is glowing. Maybe at certain intervals in the minigame you can attack the bell and ring it to clear all the heartless on screen? In the Big Hero 6 world, Sora is bouncing on these truffle heartless. This time they got this, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, maybe I don't know my fruit, but I have no clue what this thing is, a devil fruit or something? Well anyways, this green fruit is the theme of this minigame. He gets an excellent when he takes off, and this means you probably need to time your jump correctly to get more height and more points. The Japanese trailer shows us that these Heartless are on more than one rooftop, so it'll be really fun and impressive jumping from building to building in this massive world. Interesting to note that all of the minigame's distinct fruit themes apply to their HUD icons as well. And if you want to know, the minigames we saw in the TGS trailer were themed cherry and orange. More minigames, but at least this time we're dancing so I can finally stop saying fruit. 
This is a dancing minigame, most likely referencing the scene where Rapunzel dances with random people in the town in the movie, and it looks like you just press the appropriate command, which is color-coded when you pass through the circles. We got spin, step, clap. So for example, these purple circles here would be clap, 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 and the blue one, which Sora doesn't go through, would be step. Every time you get it right, you fill up this gauge which I guess would signal the end of the minigame. It then cuts to Sora activating a triangle command which is unfortunately unreadable and... Okay, okay, he goes up on this barrel. In the Japanese version, we do get to see a triangle command that roughly translates to something like Sunshine Circle, and I don't think Sunshine Circle is the same command as this barrel trick, so there may be multiple cool tricks you can do in this dancing minigame. Next, we take a look at some of the heartless bosses in the worlds. In Kingdom Hearts 3, worlds are bigger and it's expected that we go through multiple boss-like encounters before we fight the boss of what the world is, so none of these may be the actual end boss of the Disney World. In Tangled, there's this chariot heartless. It charges into Sora who's wielding the frozen keyblade. Could that mean Frozen is a world right before Tangled? The hitbox is so massive that the charge hurts three of the party members even though they look like they're kind of behind the chariot. Also there's this weird rage form command here that opens up a whole new can of worms. What could that be? It's a form that's not related to Sora's Keyblade at all, something we have never ever seen in all of our coverage of Kingdom Hearts 3. It could be a legitimate form that you unlock through requirements outside of your equipped Keyblade, it could be maybe this game's version of anti-form, I have no clue what this could be, but this form potentially opens up many new possibilities for the forms of Kingdom Hearts 3. In the Japanese trailer, the Heartless collides with Sora for what seems to be quite a while before Sora finally gets hit and flies up. Oh man, and the wall bounce animation is still in the final game. That's fine, I mean it makes sense, I just hope wall bouncing doesn't lock you up and remove your once more and second chance at awkward times where you aren't really able to do anything like it sometimes did in 0.2 which led to some frustrating deaths. Sora dives into the water to fight an underwater boss in the Caribbean, and in the Japanese trailer you can see for a split second a hidden Mickey here. It was confirmed in the past on an IGN livestream with a Square Enix community manager that players will be rewarded for finding these hidden Mickeys in some way in the full game. If you look really carefully, you'll notice right as soon as Sora dives into the water, Jack rolls right out of the party. I guess Jack can't swim. While underwater, all of Sora's spells except for the legendary Cura have been replaced with sea versions. And man, sea blizzard just looks beautiful. I wonder what sea fire is supposed to be like. Hey, if we're underwater, how could there be a- Props to them for getting such a cool shot of the blizzard in the Japanese one where it looks like the Heartless bites the blizzard to break it. I don't think that's what's actually happening and it's a coincidence here, but god does that look cool in a trailer. Going back to minigames for just a second, there's this timed Gigas minigame where it looks like you go through some kind of course and try to eliminate all the enemies for a high score. The enemies all have a red marker over their head except for this guy way in the back who has a bigger purple symbol over him. I wonder if that indicates like a boss or a target enemy or something. The only thing we can see here that makes it seem like the Toy Story world is the Giga's toys moving around. This area otherwise is completely unseen and if I didn't know any better I would have guessed that it was the Monsters Inc world. You can't shrink down to toy size and get into a Giga's mech in other worlds, right? Sora activates the High Wind Keyblade transformation on the Davy Jones boss battle in the Caribbean and it's so nice to see a human sized boss battle with that beautiful beautiful stagger. While he's doing this on Davy Jones, we see a situation command come up for Goofy Bombarder, which I believe is a completely different Goofy combination attack from the old Goofy shot that we've seen in previous gameplay. In the Japanese trailer, he does it on the floor instead, giving us a bit of a cleaner look at the battle arena. Okay, in Monsters Inc. for real this time, we got this super strange gooey boss. This is the only one of the bosses we'll see today that is an unversed instead of a heartless because you know Vanitas is the one invading this world. You can tell because this boss has the trademark unversed eye shape. What is this dude? It's got hands ready to smack you from all boundaries of the arena and it sends out little babies to cover the ground in ink. Oh, oh no. Ew, please do not remind me. No, no, not in Kingdom Hearts. No. At the very end before the cut, you can see that the little guys crawling out through the ink are separate enemies that you can attack. 
The shape of it before it cuts even looks like it might be one of those hands. Our next boss, another tangled boss, attacks with roots coming out of the ground. We see these orbs spawning and falling, and they kind of look like seeds, and when they touch the ground, they begin to glow. It looks like when they're glowing, they explode and hurt anything they touch, maybe even the boss himself. We can see a better view of these things exploding at the start of the Japanese footage. Notice that during this boss, Rapunzel and Flynn are not in your party in the story. Hmm, this is a very interesting looking boss. And in our final gameplay clip, we get another look at the successor to Kingdom Hearts 2's 1000 Heartless battle. In this shot, we can see both Heartless and Nobodies, and of course, Vanitas fans need not worry because we also got Unversed, seen in the previous trailer and in the Japanese version of this trailer. Notably, we can see this rock troll guy here, and that means Giant Heartless will be here mid-battle as well. This is something they wanted to do in Kingdom Hearts 2. In fact, in older trailers of that game, you could see the Behemoth Heartless in the 1000 Heartless battle, but it did not make it to the final game, probably for technical limitations. Instead of a counter this time, we just have this enemy bar in the corner, so there's no number to confirm the amount of enemies we got to defeat in this fight. Sora also has a situation command for a party member interaction we haven't yet seen called Trinity Guard, or at least something we haven't yet seen the name for. I think this is probably the combination attack we saw way back in E3 2015's trailer. Sora is doing the basic combo with Mirage Staff, which does seem to be a great option for crowd control. When Sora kills Shadows, they don't have their particle effect for their death animation like they did in 0.2, and they just gradually fade out of view. This might be an additional move to save resources and processing power. Another move which is similar to Kingdom Hearts 2 is that these enemies in the distance, the ones waiting way in the back, have very little frames of animation and don't seem to move much. I can't tell if they're actually 2D sprites or not, but these guys in the back definitely wait around to let Sora fight the enemies nearby and aren't really active enemies. I think it's really interesting that we'll get to do this kind of fight again, but this time no reaction commands to bail us out. We'll have to fight the enemies for real this time. Alright, and with that we're all done with every bit of gameplay in this trailer. The rest and the heavy hitter of this trailer lies in the story. And I'm warning you right now, I'm gonna go off the walls with crazy wild speculation and ask a ton of questions. So I hope as Kingdom Hearts fans, you do like that kind of stuff. Let's take a look. So tomorrow, you and me in the ring. You ready? Don't hold back, Lee. Promise? Kyrie and Lee are talking in what looks to be that realm Merlin created for them to train in a pre-rendered scene again. And, oh Kyrie, what did they do to you? Well, she's in her Kingdom Hearts 2 design here, so this scene takes place before the one we saw at E3. Sounds like tomorrow these two will be fighting, of course, to train with their Keyblades. Lee is barely paying attention, but when he turns to look, he sees a silhouette of Xion. The line Kyrie says is also a direct reference to Xion's line in Days, where she asks Axel not to hold back. Please don't hold back, Axel. I promise. This could also be the same scene we saw from the TGS trailer where Lee bursts into tears because it probably caught him off guard, just as I thought last time. In fact, taking a look at all of Lee's scenes, it seems a huge bulk of his story arc in this game will be centered around Xion. We'll see a little more of that later. We see that dark area in the Toy Story world once again, Sora runs up and attacks young Xehanort to try and stop him from leaving. Judging by the look of the scenes in this trailer, if I had to guess the layout, it starts with the Buzz abduction scene, then boss battle, and then young Xehanort leaving and the sky clearing up after that. But what is this boss? Well, in this shot of Sora running up to young Xehanort, he has his Keyblade out, and this could be our first young Xehanort boss battle, and after this fight, he escapes to reappear later in the story. What's super interesting is that as he's fading away, he quietly tells Sora to find the hearts joined to his. It could be the good old classic organization taunting, but uh, let's look at it from a different angle. The tone of his voice. Find the hearts to the tears. Even Sora's reaction. He sounds like he's trying to help Sora in some weird way. Maybe young Xehanort is a victim in all of this somehow. Like he first joined in on the whole time travel plan with Ansem when he came to pick him up on Destiny Islands, all like, yeah, old me, woo, I got a plan, future me, let's do it. And when he got further into it, too deep to back out, he realized that his old self was just a little bit too wild for him and he had second thoughts and wants to find a way to stop this now. 
I don't know how old Xehanort would turn out to be the way he is though, but this wacky idea has a bit of merit behind it. Mainly because the symbolism in the recent opening would also fit this narrative. As you can see, Xehanort's eyes are grey instead of yellow, and he looks into a purple dark blast thing from the sky. This scene looks like it's trying to imply that young Xehanort was not evil at first, and something corrupted him. And now, this seemingly out of character line from young Xehanort may be adding fuel to that fire. Back at the Keyblade Graveyard, like I said earlier, it looks like we'll see scenes of this area periodically over the course of the game to see what's up with the organization behind the scenes. Saiyak says he would hate to see them let someone rejoin the organization only to find they failed to deliver the final, presumably 13th vessel for Xehanort. Well, judging by what Saiyak is saying and the figure shown here, who looks to have a full-grown figure instead of someone shorter or smaller like Venetus or Roxas or something, I think this man here is Vexen. Vexen was considered a traitor and that's how his story ended in Chain of Memories, being killed by a fellow organization member. Remember, the organization was targeting Sora for the 13th vessel in Dream Drop Distance, and when they couldn't get him, the organization would likely be trying to find new ways to replace any missing slots. Having Vexen in here and giving him a chance to provide a new 13th vessel makes perfect sense. And who is that 13th? Well, we'll take it one step at a time. Also, am I crazy or is there a hooded figure sitting here? It could be just a shadow, but I don't know. We get a continuation of the Venetus encounter in Monsters Inc. that we originally saw at D23 Japan earlier this year. And this time, Venetus whacks Sora's Keyblade out of his hand and you see Ventus appear over Sora briefly. We already know that Venetus wants to get Ven's heart out of Sora and complete his own from that old trailer too. There's no way Ven's heart could be removed from Sora this early in the game, could there? Well, you never know, this game is crazy. Maleficent and Pete are in Twilight Town and Pete is asking her about where to look for the black box. She tells him that a Keyblade War is upon us. Way to dodge the question, Maleficent. I do think they just cut up the scene in a weird way. In a screenshot from earlier this year, we had another look at this scene, and Pete says that there's a lot of black boxes and they all end up being the wrong one. I think this is a hilarious dynamic that will be going on over the course of the whole game for our Disney villains, them asking someone in every world for a black box only to find a wrong black box in every single world. Very good gag, Nomura. So anyways, Maleficent is definitely aware of what's happening and why she herself wants the black box is still unclear, since we know before she wanted a book of prophecies to rule over her own world, but that desire just seems completely gone in favor of this. The missing piece on how she learned about the black box could be revealed in... <sighs> Union Cross, probably. Anyways, there's neat little posters on the walls for this scene advertising parts of Twilight Town. Here we got a tram, and here we get to see the clock tower and... Litter? In my Twilight Town? Well, over on that clock tower, we have a scene of Lee and Isa having a reunion together. Lee is clearly trying to offer Isa some ice cream, but I'm not so sure he's an ice cream kind of guy. This is a scene that I was very, very interested in from the TGS trailer. It seems like they're trying to catch up, which is definitely weird because they are on opposite sides in this battle, but also really heartwarming almost to see these two best friends from Birth by Sleep finally acting like friends again. Isa tells Lee that over time he had awakened to a new purpose, and what he's speaking of though is not clear. This could be the two of them reminiscing over their time in the organization from Days to Kingdom Hearts 2, explaining their sides of the little dramatic struggle these two had. Saix was definitely jealous of Axel becoming so friendly with Roxas and Xion, and in his own weird way, him being upset about all that was probably just showing that what Axel was doing was all Saix wanted all along. Seeing this and wishing he had his own heart back, Saix put all his effort into being as strict about the missions as possible and doing anything to get Kingdom Hearts so he can have his heart back and be friends with Axel and anyone else from his life again. It was a good effort, but we all know that didn't really work out for him in the end. Kingdom Hearts... Where is my heart? So this scene is either Isa explaining his behavior from back then and why he acted the way he acted, or it's him talking about the current organization and he's speaking about him giving in completely to Xehanort's ambition. I'd prefer the first because it would make for a much more heartfelt reunion here. 
In the next scene, we got Mickey agreeing with something Kyrie said and telling Sora that we're all in this together. <sighs> and no, I'm not gonna make a high school musical joke here. But I do need to talk to you guys about this scene with all these out of focus but surely beautiful high res leaves, my brother. We get a close up shot of Nominee's room, and this looks like the closest we will ever see to Nominee in a trailer for this game. They're keeping her a real good secret. Ansem the Wise tells Ansem Seeker of Darkness, wow, I've been on this series since the beginning and somehow writing that made me laugh in 2018. Anyways, Ansem says to Ansem that he created enough victims, and this follows his whole repentance and guilty story arc he had since the end of Kingdom Hearts 2. But then, Ansem Seeker of Darkness says something interesting. All of the children sacrificed in the name of your research. We know from back in the day, Ansem would go pretty far and try to get really in-depth to study the mysteries of the heart. And this line could just be the apprentice Xehanort memories inside of Ansem, just remembering the experiments from back in the day. Well, that's our down-to-earth theory. But let's get a crazy out-of-this-world theory in here, shall we? I'm actually really, really happy this scene is in the trailer because I was gonna make this theory in its own separate video back in October when a certain Union Cross update hit. But since I never got to do it, I'll tell you a short version of the wild theory in this video. Ansem says the children sacrificed. Typically in Kingdom Hearts, when the term children is used like that, it refers to the children in the old times who restored the world with the light in their hearts, and these children are the characters of Kingdom Hearts Union Cross. In that October scene, Maleficent got sent back to the quote, past, and something that happened back here may also be where she gets obsessed with the black box. Anyway, she was mistakenly sent here and it was revealed to her that the worlds of Union Cross after the Keyblade War are no longer projected from the Book of Prophecies, but are instead worlds made from data. Even worlds that did not exist yet are projected as data here. This place she was sent to is not the real world, but a world of data. Well, that's score one for my old Unchained Key theory, but let's go deeper, and let's get to the point. She learns all of this from this dark figure, whose silhouette looks like some old TV static type of thing. He doesn't give his name, but says that she can call him Darkness. Your first thought would probably be the Master of Masters or Lushu, but this person talks to Maleficent so personally, it's almost as if there's someone from that future themselves. Darkness is running this data projection. Darkness. Who is Darkness? Darkness in Zero. Diz. Darkness in Zero! I had the little idea that Diz was sometime in modern day running a data projection which is what we know of as Union Cross after the war. At the very least, he found a way to run the Disney worlds and would use this data to somehow connect to and collect data on the children of the past whose consciousness were stored in the Unchained Realm. And maybe it ended in some way that wasn't pretty and all the children or players of Union Cross were sacrificed in some way. All of the children except Ventus, who managed to survive after being found by Xehanort. That's my crazy out there theory. It's a little rough around the edges, but I thought I might have been onto something. I can't believe something I thought of in October is relevant to the new trailer, but it got me excited. Next, we got Riku vs. Riku, with Ansem watching them fight in the back. Again, we don't know if it's Riku replica, a past Riku Ansem, or what. And we don't know if this unhooded Riku is the same as this Riku from the TGS trailer, but a little thing to note is that this one here does have the yellow eyes and the one from the E3 trailer that was chilling with Riku had normal blue eyes. Did something happen to this Riku over the course of the story to become this Riku, or is this a different one? Also, why is nobody wearing coats? What is going on in this scene? Well, Ansem fought without his coat in Dream Drop Distance before the organization reveal, so I guess it's not that weird, but it's still kind of weird. And if we take a look at the scene at the very beginning, you can see some rubble falling off of these ruins, which tells us in this scene, the ruins were just put up right before this fight was happening, or there's something else going on at the top of the ruins that's causing the rubble to fall. In the Big Hero 6 world, we got a scene in which Sora is not wearing the Big Hero 6 visor over his face for some reason, but young Xehanort tells him that he will pay a price for wielding such a power foolishly. To be honest with you, I have little to no idea what power he could be talking to Sora about. Sure, he could be talking about the Keyblade, but that's a little weird to single out Sora when everyone wields Keyblades, including himself. Xehanort got so bored of his Keyblade, he made like 13 more to play with. His no saving you line, though, seems to foreshadow the tense events of these final battle scenes. 
Sora, Riku, and Kairi all slash away at the shadows from a demon tide that just seems to be coming at everybody. Oh my god, in fact, there's two demon towers behind Riku. It's just raining heartless, literally. You can also see that the Keyblade Graveyard has been upgraded a bit more from previous games, now showing old Keyblades stuck in the rock walls and pillars instead of just on the ground. How does that work? Were there Keyblades underground? Or did somebody do that Keyblade wave attack again and just hit all the walls? In the Winnie the Pooh trailer, we did see Keyblades falling from the sky, so maybe it has something to do with that. In the next scene, it looks like the evil Riku summons this giant, kind of bald-headed Xehanort-looking shadow out of him. Riku seemed very close to Ansem in the last scene, with Ansem looking like he's overseeing him, so maybe this dark figure is like... the Guardian? Or maybe a new evolution of the Guardian? Aw, oh, come on Lee, that joke is so 2014. Anyways, a hooded figure points a kingdom key at Lee with Xemnas watching in the back. It kind of feels similar to the way Ansem was overseeing Riku in the last scene. Well, if it wasn't obvious, I think this figure is definitely Xion. First of all, Roxas was shown in a previous trailer to be wielding Oathkeeper and Oblivion, but not only that, remember how I said earlier I thought they let Vexen back into the organization and tasked him with getting a 13th vessel? Well, my theory is that Vexen found a way to create a brand new Xion puppet for the organization. The idea I got here is this is not even a resurrection of the old Xion, so while Lee is here having memories thinking of the old Xion, this is a brand new model, Xion 2.0. So even when Lee inevitably does remember who she is completely, this Xion will have no idea at all who Lee is and it will make for a sad scene. I also think that this would give Naminé a role in the game. If this theory is true, then at the end of the game when everything is getting resolved, Naminé can try to extract the original Xion memories out of Sora and put them into this new Xion 2.0 body, and that'll serve as a way for her to remember Axel and Roxas. Doesn't that sound crazy and cool? Yeah, it might be a little out there, but I mean, that's what we're here for. Regardless of my Xion 2.0 theory, I still do think this is Xion no matter what, even if they somehow have the original. After that, Xemnas launches his final desperation move from Kingdom Hearts 2 on Lee with a Berserk Aiza standing right behind him. And I mean, Namora did say no reaction commands are in Kingdom Hearts 3, so uh, I'm sorry Lee, you're just gonna have to eat that. But uh, do you guys think this scene could be a potential scene for Aiza to betray the organization? After having what might be a heartfelt reunion with Lee in Twilight Town, seeing this happen to his best friend could be the final straw and maybe could cause Aiza to attack Xemnas in Berserk mode instead of backing him up. Would be cool to see. In the next scene, we see these dark chains grabbing Sora. The whole chains motif always seemed to be a trademark of the students of Ericus, or at the very least, Terra used them to trap Xehanort and Aqua used them after she inherited the Master Keeper for herself. These new chains are not exactly the same pattern, but they seem to have the same concept. It could be Terra Nort since that's Terra's body there, or it could be the old man Xehanort himself. Dark chains could be something he had all along too, you know, being a best friend of Ericus and them both sharing the same master, it would make sense. There's a second chain that's holding a sleeping Ventus, and two more chains going off screen, which I don't know could be going for Riku, Kairi, Donald, Goofy, Mickey, anyone really. After that, Mickey gets sucked into this slab book thing that's glowing purple. If we take a closer look at the front, it has the Roxas symbol on it. The symbol he has on his necklace. I have no clue why this is here or what this has to do with Roxas, as it looks like Mickey is surrounded by Luxord's cards, so you would think that it's Luxord that's doing this, so why the Roxas symbol? Looking at Mickey's pose, we can see that this is a scene that is shown in one of the new KH3 commercials, and Mickey's in this pose because he was protecting Sora from one of Luxord's cards that was heading his way. If we look even closer, we can see that the inside of this card might have that same Roxas symbol on it. So after Mickey blocked this card, he got sucked into the vortex. Maybe Luxord was aiming this at Sora in an attempt to get Roxas out of him, or something like that. Well, Mickey's dead. In our next shot, there's a giant laser firing down on the group. I do really think it's a laser that's being shot at them, and not something Donald is firing because if you look closely at the point of impact, there's a shockwave kind of erupting that makes it look like the laser is being fired at the ground from above. 
If it is a laser being shot from above, it's most likely an attack from Xemnas since he's known for red lasers. Going with the assumption that it is being fired down on the ground, that means Donald was the one who took one for the team and blocked that laser with his magic or something. This causes him to lose all energy and collapse. Well, Donald's dead. In Kingdom Hearts 1, it was Sora, Kingdom Hearts 2, it was Goofy, so it's only fair that it's Donald's turn in Kingdom Hearts 3. Rewind for just a second and you can see that at the point of impact, Kairi chose to hide behind Sora. Maybe it could hint at their relationship progressing in Kingdom Hearts 3. For some reason, Lee is lying down unconscious against a rock when a swarm of Heartless approaches Kairi and Kairi tries to move him out of the way. Axel? Axel. Axel's dead. Anyways, it does seem like Kairi was successful with moving him in this shot because if we look between the Heartless after they move, they're no longer there. In our next shot, we see Mickey and Goofy bracing for impact from another swarm of Heartless. Behind them, we can see a pathway though. Could this be the same crevice that the Birth by Sleep trio walked through to get to this area of the Keyblade Graveyard for their final battle? The Heartless Swarm appears to have picked up Mickey, Donald, and Goofy. In the last frames of this animation, we can see that they're no longer here, and there's this purple effect coming out as if they took damage. And Kyrie's dead. Wow, that's a gigantic swarm of Heartless. Heartless Tornado or something. In our final scene here, Riku is protecting Sora from the swarm of Heartless that's been eating everyone. He reassures Sora that he doesn't believe something, either something Sora said or something a villain said to him. It's also worth noting that uh, it doesn't look like Riku's actually talking in this scene, so this line could be said either before or after Riku blocks this attack. It's unknown, but he may not be necessarily saying it during this attack, and this could be some clever editing. And with that, Sora just screams in agony. Shout out to Haley Joel Osment. A lot of us were worried about his voice performance, and here he is killing it. The Japanese scream is just as bone chilling as well. This may not be the most relevant thing ever, but the pose Sora does while he's screaming is very similar to something Ventus did in Birth by Sleep. Anyways, they may have edited these scenes out of order, but the way it looks right now is Sora says something like, he's losing hope or we can't do this, and then Riku comes in to protect him from the shadows. And then at the start of this shot, we see these blue sparkles here, and that could be someone fading away. You know, Riku is dead. And then, after that... Seeing Riku, his last ally, consumed by the darkness makes Sora lose all hope, and he says he can't do this alone. This looks like it could be a pivotal point in Sora's character development. Remember, Sora's whole thing from the very beginning was his friends. My friends. They are my power. Now, without his friends, Sora may have to rely on his own strength. Of course, I don't think he'll drop the bonds or their fuel for his power at all, but maybe he'll have to learn the importance of believing in oneself or something like that. Okay, okay, in case you couldn't tell, I was joking when I was saying everyone is dead. I don't think they're all gonna die, but I do think they could all potentially have what looks like a death scene here, leaving Sora feeling alone and hopeless. And to Sora, he would really think they're all dead. But there's one scene that I purposely skipped until now to talk about, and that's this one with Chirithi in the Cloud World. This Cloud World and Chirithi sequence was revealed in the Winnie the Pooh trailer last month, and what I think is going on here is the Cloud World is within Sora's heart. You know, Sora means sky, and this is clearly a sky area. Chirithi is here and probably knows Sora now because of Ventus, and that's because of Ventus's role in, uh... Union Cross, which I'm not going to be talking about, but the down-to-earth theory is that Sora goes to the Cloud World to figure out a way to give Ventus his part of his heart back, which makes perfect sense. But if we think a little deeper, a little crazier, a little further, he could dive into this area again, looking deep within himself for help after the tragedy he experienced at the Keyblade Graveyard. And I think that's possible because of this line right here. Haven't you already learned how to restore someone's heart after it's been lost? He may be referring to the power of waking Riku learned after becoming master in Dream Drop Distance, 
or he could be referring to a brand new power Sora learns in Kingdom Hearts 3. But he's trying to get Sora to realize that he can save a heart that has been lost, and Sora can use this power to restore Riku or whoever else it is that dies in these scenes. That's what I think could have a chance of going on with this Charity Cloud World stuff. And that's all. That was the last trailer for Kingdom Hearts 3 that I will ever be doing an analysis on. I know some of my theories were of course out there, but that's the point. And I really wanted to explore the possibilities and tell you guys what I think could really be- Wait, what? More? What do you mean there's more? I've done all this work on this long trailer analysis and you're telling me that there's- Once a seat of power for all Keyblade wielders. Here I and my other selves can be one in Scala et Kylo. <laughs> what is this? Where do I even begin? Well, first off, brilliant, brilliant job throwing in this scene with no music, no context. It is genuinely creepy not knowing at all what all of this is. Let's start with Xehanort's vessels. All have lost any semblance of personality they had. They're all the same height, they have this new alien cult-like outfit on with a weird headdress that almost reminds me of Armor of the Master from Birth by Sleep. Hands looking sort of like darkling creatures which again are on the box art and heels? What? They're floating but they feel like they're just hanging there like lifeless puppets. Are these even the same 12 Xehanorts? Or did he find completely new vessels for this what looks like endgame stuff? Xehanort says something was once a seat of power for all Keyblade wielders. What could that mean? Is, is what he's doing right now about to benefit Sora and all the other Keyblade wielders who have been fighting against him somehow? He's doing some demonic ritual I guess to fuse and become one with these other selves. And of course, he says in Scala et Kylum. This is Latin and it translates to Stairway to Heaven. And since he says in Scala et Kylum, it means that either this world we're looking at right now is called Scala et Kylum, or he's opening a path to a place with that name right now. Let me just take a second also to just say Xehanort's new voice actor, I don't know who it is, but he did a great, great job in this trailer. He, he just really nailed the feeling of Xehanort and the sense of mystery in this scene. I know he doesn't have that kind of like reverberating tone that Leonard Nimoy did, but he is doing fantastic. I really did not like him, his line in the Winnie the Pooh trailer, but I am completely on the opposite side here and I think he's doing great in this scene. Looking around, this this world is huge, like like literally huge. I don't even know how they had the time to make all this. Windmills everywhere, green flags hanging, some shops, like this place with a top hat and what looks to be some kind of bakery. This is an actual place people would live in, not some evil final battleground for some ritual. Well, there's also cables connecting the giant structures, which makes this seem like the ever-famed Cable Town that we heard about in 2014 from the Closed Door trailer. Cable Town was also referred to as like the land of departure back then by people who watched that trailer, which makes sense since, come on now, you really think a world would actually be called land of departure and that world is like this monument connected to a bunch of mountains? It did seem broken up, fragmented, and incomplete. So, this could be the real Land of Departure, the place where Ericus and Xehanort were playing chess all along even, and something happened to make the world become Land of Departure later on. Getting to this world may have been a goal Xehanort had all along with his Kingdom Hearts thing, or this world could be whatever the Keyblade Graveyard was in the past, the far past. We have seen ruins being brought out from the ground by Xehanort in the Keyblade Graveyard, and there are some not perfect but similar looking patterns on the buildings. The pointy looking symbol on top of these structures looks similar to multiple things over the series, but I guess most recently you can see something similar on the Master of Masters chair. Going back to the scary guy's helmets for just another second, the points on their head could also be a reference to this mysterious symbol. But 
the most conclusive evidence I have found for the ruins being related to Scala and Kylum is that this pointy symbol can be seen in the chain scene for a split second in the wall of these ruins. So it could be like Xehanort brought these ruins up, restored the world with Kingdom Hearts' power, or Xehanort even was able to send himself and Sora to the past to when this world was prospering to complete whatever his true plan is? The possibilities honestly stretch for miles with this crazy scene. Sora, while looking very cool, may be alone with the 13 Xehanorts in this weird... Like, bro, we don't know what timeline this is. I don't even know. Sora seems just as freaked out as we all are. I'm talking about this scene as a whole. This scene could be taking place after you've been in this world for a little while, and Sora maybe fought his way all the way up here, or this could be what happens right when Sora lands in the world. And if we look at the world, it has even more detail we don't know about. We can see what is either a body of water behind Sora, or what I think is just the sky between all these floating platforms, which I guess would make more sense considering the Stairway to Heaven name. This world could be just a world very high up somewhere. Whatever this place is, I think this will be the place where Xehanort's true intentions are revealed and we'll know what's going on. But to be honest, there's no real way of figuring it out from what we have here. I am very, very impressed and super excited with what Nomura has come up with here, like seriously. This may be the final world he was talking about that was his favorite and something he always wanted to do. Whatever it is that happens here, all I know is it's going to be really interesting when we finally get to play the game ourselves. A seat of power for all Keyblade wielders. Hmm. And okay, this is the real end of our trailer. That is the final Kingdom Hearts 3 trailer and that was my final trailer analysis for this game. I know this was really long, so I appreciate you sticking it out and making it to the end of the video. I'm really sorry for the length. I honestly thought this was gonna be short, and in the middle of working here, I was like, oh no, why is this so big? Well, it, it's fitting anyway, for it being my final analysis for me to go out with a bang. Well, my friends, this is it. It's truly been an honor being your guide to go to for analysis and secrets from all the New Kingdom Hearts trailers. But I'm finished with this work now. Until next time, I've been Sir Alum one and I'll catch you guys later.